Hello, it's Chris Bottrell here from Chris Bottrell Photography and welcome to the second part of the Drone Photography Masterclass. Um, this uh, tutorial was going to cover um, just two things but I've decided to put three into it as it is Easter Sunday and uh, I've got a beer in my hand so, you know, let's do it. So, what we're going to cover is capture settings, filters and the use of the DJI transcoding tool. So, um, let's go with capture settings. Well, first of all, um, in order to get the best footage out of your drone, I would always, always say shoot as low ISO as possible um, because the, uh, the Phantom 3 and the Inspire 1 standard do struggle at um, higher ISO noises. Um, so ISO 100, if you're shooting during the day, that will be absolutely fine. Um, shutter speed um, is a, is very, very important. Um, always try and keep to the 180 degree shutter rule, which was uh, originally used in film, um, which basically means um, that if you're shooting um, here in, in the UK, um, we usually shoot uh, um, 4K 25 or 1080p 25, so we want our shutter speed to be exactly double that, uh, which is 50 uh, 50 frames a second or 50 shutter actuations a second. Uh, over in the States, um, uh, a lot of people shoot in 30p, so you would want your shutter speed to be 60, um, and that basically gives you that nice sort of like motion blur um that, that you would expect from film if you have your shutter sort of too fast that's when um the the camera will start picking up every single little movement going on there so that's when you start getting problems with uh jello um and it just looks pretty awful so uh, have an experiment around if you want um you know try different shutter speeds see what you think but um yeah the uh the 180 degree shutter rule which is double your capture rate is always uh, the best way to go um, now as far as picture styles go um, if you you know if you just run in and gun in and you want to um, you know just capture what's going on there because it's you know a you say something's going down or something and you know you, you desperately want to capture it you know s s stick to normal whatever you like um, but you know if you're on a on a plan shoot then uh, I strongly recommend you shoot in log mode uh, log is short for logarithmic um, and it's basically it's, a, it's like a, a mathematical equation where it takes um, instead of being in linear color space which will take um, say for instance uh, you've got like um, 50 different shades of black or 50 shades of gray that could be another one um, what it will do is rather than in 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 linear color space rather than going um, from uh, stop to stop to stop in log mode it will actually split that even finer down so you get a lot more um, finer detail in uh, in your highlights your shadows and your midtones I probably didn't explain it the best way but do a Google search um, have a look at, uh, at log and look at the science behind it and you'll, you'll understand how it works um, so yes yeah, sh shooting log mode you um, obviously DJI advertises uh, their cameras as having 12 point something stops a dynamic range um, that quote is only shooting in log mode no other modes will you get that amount of dynamic range and it, you know it gives you the basis of a, a really good grade so if you can nail log mode you know get your your exposure settings right you're you're pretty good to go um, so that is capture settings in a in a in a nutshell. Um, but what one thing that I will say is, some people shoot in log mode and they say you know dial down your sharpness, dial down your contrast, dial down this. I personally don't at all. Reason being is because the moment you start changing stuff, you start changing how the logarithmic algorithms work. So I have everything as standard. Um, I know DJI are always bringing out new firmwares that bugger everything up um, you know picture styles change but I like to keep it pretty standard uh, so next uh, we're going to look at filters um, there are many different um, filter manufacturers out there um, uh, Polar Pro here these are popular ones that a lot of people are using um, before I got into aerial photography I'd never heard of Polar Pro before um, I've always used Hoyer filters on my full-frame cameras um, which are pretty darn good. 
uh, but obviously that they don't make them for um, the, the the smaller lenses. But the uh, DJI X5 um, uh, is the 46 mil ring, and you can get them for them. So you've got all these different types of filters. You've got your your ND filters, and you've got polarizing filters, and then you've got these graduated filters. Now. Basically, if, if, if I, don't, I don't know if you guys, you know, watching, obviously some of you will come from many different backgrounds. Some may not know a lot about photography, some may do. Um, with the uh, ND filters, what they basically do is they obviously cut the light down going into your camera. So you could look at them as being cool shades for your camera. Um, and what this does is enables you to get that 50, uh, uh, 50 frames a second shutter rate. Um, now, if you were to go out on a bright sunny day um, with no ND filter on and you would try to get um, a shutter speed of 50 or 150th of a second, you, you just won't do it. Um, you, you'd be looking at really high shutter rates, um, even at a really, really low ISO. So, um, you know, screw on an ND filter, that will help it bring it down, um, depending on the intensity, the sun and the ambient light, blah, 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 um, depends on which filters you get. So it's always best to go for a set. Um, I know that they do um, bar, um, a set of six, I think is the most popular one people are using, um, that comes with a polarizing filter as well. So I'll give you some examples of here. Um, so let's quickly start with polarizing. Um, obviously you can see the difference polarizer. I, this isn't my image, I stole it off Google. Um, you can see on the right polarizing filter um, is, is being used. Um, it will basically take uh, a lot of reflections um, off. You can see on top of the uh, the crops here, there there's uh, there's a lot of reflections on top. Whereas over this side, there's there's none. Uh, it makes your skies much bluer. Looks looks pretty cool. So polarizing filters are great, and you can also get um, ND filters with a polarizer built in. Now, if we move over to NDs, these are ND examples. Uh, so that was um, with an ND filter. Um, I think that was an ND16 on that picture. And then you've got this one here, which was, um, I think, an ND32. Can't remember. This one here had nothing on it at all, so you can see it's overexposed. These weren't taken on a, on a drone. These were actually taken on my Canon 5D Mark III. Because um, obviously it's really difficult to change and uh, filters while you're flying. Well, it's impossible unless you've got a big ladder. Um, and then you've got this one here, which, uh, so this one here was uh, just a normal filter, whereas this one here was a graduated ND filter with a polarizer. So you can see it goes from the top, um, it goes, it's nice and dark, maybe a little bit too dark, and then gets lighter as you go down. Um, going, uh, on now from filters, I'm going to talk about the DJI transcoding tool, um, which is this program here. And if you read the about section, it tells you what it does. It's basically it transcodes log to normal color video, which is a Rec 709 color space. And what it does is it applies a LUT or a lookup table. I think it's in cube format. Um, if I'm not mistaken on that, yes it is, it's in cube format. Um, so it will take your footage from, uh, wrong one, this here is a uh, frame grab that was shot um, in log mode and after you apply the LUT, it turns into that. So it basically uh, brings it back to normal color space from, um, from log to Rec 709. Um, now with the transcoding tool, um, you can output it to uh, all these different um, uh, different qualities of Apple ProRes. Um, it's quite self-explanatory. Input fi uh, files, and then you put your output directory, and you choose what you want. Proxy is really low um, quality for proxy uh, editing. I usually go for either um, standard or or high quality. You can choose uh, a movie file or an AVI. I always stick with Move move mov uh, and you can choose your gamma as well so if you're using your expire one uh expire what am i on about too many beers inspire one choose that one um 
Gamma 2.2s for Mac, uh, Gamma 1.8s PC. Linear will basically do nothing for it, or you can choose, if you're on the X5, choose the X5. Um, if you shoot in with the uh, Phantom, um, choose the, um, if you're on PC, 1.8 or 2.2 for for Mac, or you could use the Inspire 1 experiment, see, see what you think of it, um, you know. Uh, so basically, people um, uh, been a lot of people asking recently why use the transcoding tool. You know what what benefit does it give you? Well, you know you, you've probably heard that expression you can't polish shit. Well, you sort of can a little bit with this tool. Um, obviously, it brings it up to ProRes. Well, it says four two two ten bit. Yes, it will, but it obviously won't add any information in per se. But it will. Um, make your footage look a little bit better now the files that this thing produces are absolutely huge um, if you look at uh, this particular clip here uh, the original um, what one's that that's uh, transcoded six so that one there was original was about two gigabyte and this one here is 9.67 gigabytes so you can see it so uh, it makes the file a lot bigger now you're probably wondering you know why why do you want to do that well the main reason is these uh, non-linear editing systems aren't designed to edit highly compressed footage which um, which these drones produce um, and it struggles you know each time you uh, press play it will play it okay but each time you want to try and make an edit to it or a change to it, it will really struggle because it needs to decompress it, compress it, and it just puts massive strain on your graphics card, massive strain on your um, CPU. So, uh, you know, the, the, the ProRes is a more um, sort of friendlier um, format to use that the editing systems, you know, seem to really, really like. Now, if you could imagine the compressed... Uh, footage, raw footage, straight off the drone. If you could imagine that as, um, I've been thinking about this all bloody day, right, how to explain it, but if you think about it as a cube about the size of a dice, right, of frozen cream, right, it's really hard and compressed. You try and spread that over a bit of toast. I don't know why you would want to put cream on toast, but, you know, this is my way of explaining it. If you try and put it over there, it's just not going to work and it's going to spread really, really thin in the end and it's going to end up breaking your toast. And nobody likes broken toast. I don't. It's stupid. So when you use the transcoding tool, it will make these files much bigger and it will give it more depth. Now, the way that I look at it is the, as I said, the, uh, the original raw footage of being a frozen cube of cream. And uh, once it's transcoded, I look at it as double cream being whipped spreads much easier you've got a lot more thickness to work with and you, your footage probably won't fall as fall apart quite as quickly as um as what it would do if you were using the native uh raw format so so that is the basics of the uh the capture settings the filters and the uh, dji transcoding tool i would highly recommend that you have a, have a little play with it and uh, and see what you think. Um, I haven't tried this myself yet, but if you wanted to uh, transcode this into um, uh, into ProRes without having the lookup table or the LUT applied, um, try linear. I've got a funny feeling that that will do it. If not, if you look in your program files, which are here, you can in, go into uh, program files, DJI transcoding tool, and you can actually see that there is a dlog to rgb.cube file there. That is the file that actually um, uh, that was the LUT file. It's just in a different format, which is called a cube file. Um, I'm not sure if you delete that or um, comment it out. What will happen? Um, maybe I'll do it as an experiment and, and find out. But um, personally, I. I don't mind my footage coming in um, in Rec 709. It sort of looks pretty cool, and it's uh, it's okay to grade with. So, so that's the end of this tutorial. I know that these first two have been a little bit boring, but um, obviously you've got to 
you know, cover the basics. And the next one after this one, we are going to be looking at actually doing some color correction, both in Premiere Pro and DaVinci Resolve. Um, DaVinci Resolve is my favorite go-to program, and uh, I'll tell you why in the next tutorial, but it's just so much better, so much easier, and you can do a lot, lot more. Don't be afraid of DaVinci Resolve because it's not going to bite. Um, it does look a little bit daunting to begin with, but once you start learning and navigating around how to use it, it is pretty sweet. So anyway, if you like this tutorial, please like, share and subscribe and all that shit. And I will see you in the next video.